Okay, so it's one minute past 11. Let's get going. Uh, good morning, everybody. And welcome along to number 17 in the uh, Tide uh, webinar masterclass series. Can't believe we've got to 17 already. Um, this week, we're going to be talking about how to create a successful small business marketing strategy. We have a fantastic panel um, who are ready and raring to go. Um, and I think I speak for all of us and maybe everybody who's watching uh, and saying that I'm very glad we had this scheduled for today rather than the last two days. Um, I think we're all slightly cooler and more comfortable. Uh, which is going to make a big big difference especially to me i still have a fan going but um in a much more comfortable situation in terms of heat it's great to see a good number of people here some next some names i i recognize um and some new people as well so just before we get going if we could just go on to the next slide please i'm just going to give you a quick introduction to myself and to tide so my name is kuhn hawker i'm the event manager here at tide i've been hosting these webinars since since we started back in march um and like I said, it's really good to see um, some members who recognize it and but some new faces as well. So a bit more about Tide and what we do. We are a business current account uh, designed for small to medium enterprises, for freelancers and for startups. Um, we want to be able to save you time and money with your business banking needs. We have over 200,000 customers in the UK currently um, and it's a really simple process to get, to get you signed up. Like I said, we're great for startups and freelancers as there's no monthly or annual freeze, there's no startup costs or credit checks and this means you can even try us alongside your current business bank account and compare us in terms of money we can save you and the time we can save you as well. Um, from start to finish it usually takes about five or ten minutes to get a, a business current account with us so in that time you'll get your sort code and your account number and then a few days later you'll get your bank card. Um, when I first started for Tide I signed up and it took me four minutes and 37 seconds from start to finish. I thought I'd time it just to test but that was quite an impressive uh, sign up time within the app itself uh, there are some really nice features you can see some of them on the screen as well but just a few more that I really like you get auto categorization on your spending so you can see when you spent it and where you spent it so a really nice way to keep on top of your finances that way um, we've got a new invoicing feature which means um, that you can customize your invoices with your logo and the e emails you send are totally editable as well and along with that uh, with the invoicing we've got um, a partnership with Hakodo, which gives you invoice protection so you can ensure against invoices not being paid, which is something that our customers said they wanted and something which we teamed up with Hakodo for, which is fantastic. Um, so I said it's very easy to sign up and get your card. You don't just have to have one card on your account either. You can have up to 30 cards on that account. So if you have co-directors or members of staff or other senior leadership um, who you want to be able to make um, company expenses, you can do so. You can order up to 30 cards, like I said, and for each one of those cards, really easy to track, really easy to see where people are spending money um, and making those company expenses. And my, one of my favorite uh, parts about the account as well is that you can get, you can split the one account into four sub accounts. So you can have a sub account for your taxes, a uh, sub account for your marketing spend, for your event spend. Um, and so it's another really easy way to, to manage your um, business banking uh, through Tide. Uh, I will be back. Um, to talk to you a bit more about how easy it is to sign up a bit later and about our other channels. Um, and so I just want to also give you guys a tour, a quick tour of Zoom if you're not used to it. So depending on how you're watching us, there's either a toolbar at the bottom or at the top. Uh, you'll see a chat room and a Q&A room as well. If you've got any questions to the panel as we go through, please do put those in the Q&A section and we'll have a Q&A session at the end. In the chat room, I'll be putting in uh, links that we are discussing or the panel are discussing or some of our social channel links as well towards the end. Uh, so do please keep an eye out for those in there. And if you have anything you just wanna say to the panel, if there's not a question, get those into the uh, chat room as well. So let's move on to introductions to the panel. Like I said, we're really honored uh, to have all these guys here and I'm really appreciative of them taking their time out today. Uh, so I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Uh, let's start with Kirsty. Morning, Kirsty. Good morning, thank you so much for having me. My name is Kirsty Smith and I am the co-founder of Social Circle which is a monthly networking event for social media managers and anyone that's really interested in social media marketing. So I am a little bit of a social media geek and it's what I'm going to be talking about today. Um, and I am also the uh, marketing director of an e-commerce agency based up in Birmingham called Digital Cake. Great, thanks Kirsty. Thank Pleasure, thank you for taking the time. And uh, Malcolm, good morning Malcolm, how are you? Yeah, morning, good, how are you? Good, thank you, yeah, like I said, I'm happy it's a bit cooler today. Yeah, <laughs> me too, yeah. Uh, yeah, the picture of me's got a tie on, I think I used to wear ties back about six months ago, so uh, been a long time since um, I've had it then. Uh, I'm the managing partner of uh, A4G, we're a firm of chartered accountants and business advisors and uh, we've had 25 years of uninterrupted growth, which um, I think has been 
had some good marketing on the way. And I'm going to talk today about how you get the best return on investment on your marketing spend. Wonderful. Great. Thanks, Malcolm. And Sally, good morning. Morning. Oh, it was I had a bit of a panic then. I was like, I'm on start mute. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, morning. Thanks for having me. So, um, I'm Sally Hawksford and I'm a director of a small agency, also based in Birmingham, called SHC Digital. Um, we predominantly specialise in paid media across digital marketing platforms from Google through to social, through to affiliates and programmatic, etc. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking to you today after Kirsty around um, the how you can kind of pay to play with um, digital and social advertising to kind of reach more customers, reach more people and get more bang for your buck, really. So hopefully that will be useful for some people um, who are looking to start investing in some sort of marketing spend away from just what you can do organically. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And last but my name is East. Ellen, hello. How are you? Hi, yeah, I'm well, thank you. Uh, lovely to be here. So I'm Ellen. I'm a co-founder and the head of marketing at Better Nature. Uh, we make tempeh-based products. So tempeh is a plant-based protein originating in Indonesia, which I could probably spend the next five minutes talking more about, but I won't. Um, but yeah, basically today I'll be chatting about strategy uh, mainly and how you can kind of start out with your strategy. And although it seems overwhelming to begin with, Having it a simple and clear strategy usually works out in the long run. So yeah, that's what I'll be chatting about, chatting awesome. about today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Uh, so just before we get on to the presentation itself, I just want to run a quick poll, if that's okay with everybody else. I just want to know uh, the size of the companies that everybody's working for. I know we run this poll quite often in these webinars, but it's really helpful for us to get an understanding of who we're talking to. So if you guys could just take a second to answer that poll for me, that would be fantastic. We have never had 100% uh, response. I'm, I'm waiting for that day. Maybe it's today. We'll see. Uh, we'll be at 65% for now. I'll give you a couple more seconds. Oh, 87. Anybody else? Any more? Any more? 90. Come on, let's do the 100. No, it's not going to happen. Okay, uh, let's share those results there. So, as you can see, as normal, it's more of a spike in the one to five. We have a lot of self employed people usually, but that's, yeah, that gives us a really nice idea. So, it's really good to have it. And it's quite a mix. There are a couple of people with their over over 50 plus as well so really good to have a nice mix so thank you so much for taking part in that um right let's move on to the next slide and get started we're going to start with uh with ellen and um ellen timing is really important when it comes to, to marketing and mapping out a strategy um when do you think is a good time to get us underway and as a tide member it'd be good to just hear a bit of maybe feedback on how you find tide as a as a as a tool yeah of course uh, yeah, so Tide has been great for us. I think we joined about a year ago. Um, and yeah, it's just really, really helpful to get everything set up. As you say, it's really easy to use. It's great to kind of be able to map out where your spend is going. Yeah. Um, and it's just great for organizing things like invoices as well. So yeah, it's been a really great tool for us. I think just very user friendly, uh, yeah. which is quite rare sometimes when it comes <laughs> to <funding. laughs> um, So yeah, very welcome change. Lovely. Um, Cool, yeah, and then in terms of strategy. So yeah, I think that's a question that a lot of people kind of aren't sure about. I think strategy is something that feels a bit alien to a lot of people. If you don't have experience in marketing strategy, it can feel a bit overwhelming, but actually strategy is quite straightforward, really, when you're thinking about it. It's just about finding a gap in the market you're able to make the most of. And so that's why I think it's something that people should be doing definitely from the beginning. I think your strategy will naturally be something that evolves over time it should be because you should be learning you should be you know changing but i think having a clear strategy from the get-go is is really invaluable and that's something that we've kind of valued quite highly and um, so yeah I'll, I'll go through what i think are kind of the key ways in which anyone really can can map out a strategy for their small business um, so yeah obviously first and foremost you need to consider what market you're operating in you know and what are people's pain points in that market i think sometimes we can get very excited about products which is great but if it's not really answering a key need in that market it may not have the demand that you're hoping for so i think really chatting you know if you know that you want to work in a specific sector and that's what you're really passionate about rather than sort of leading with a product and hoping it fits into the market it's often useful to go the other way around and actually chat to people in that market and look at research in that market which is usually more accessible um, than you think and just having a good you know good thorough google actually gives you a lot more than you probably expect and i think people think that the only valuable research is you know are papers that cost thousands of pounds to buy but that's not really the case i mean you can look go on social media you know do some hashtag searching see what people are talking about in that area you know 
follow industry um, magazines. There's so much you can do, you know, I'll speak more about this later in the tips section. Um, but there's, there's a lot you can do actually, which is quite accessible to really understand the market you're in. And I think before you do anything, uh, I think that's a really valuable exercise to do. Um, and you should sort of be able to see, you know, where is the white space? And that, the white space doesn't necessarily have to mean that no one is doing, you know, is creating a product that's similar to yours. But I think you can be, there's a kind of a difference between differentiation and distinction. Um, and being distinctive actually can often be more powerful. It's usually helpful to have some differentiation. So having a product that is slightly different, but if you can really take a product which maybe already exists in the market, but isn't being marketed effectively, isn't being sold effectively, it was maybe targeting the wrong audience, for example, you can take a very similar product and make it more relevant. So it doesn't necessarily have to be that if it's been done before, you can't do it. It's just about is there a white space? Is there something that no other company is doing that you can really capitalize on? And I think being really clear on that uh, from the get go is really valuable. Um, and then the next thing to consider is, can you really fill that space? So I think, you know, it's great to see a market and see there's some white space and you're like, oh, that's great. I can, I can do that. But just be really certain that is something you can achieve. Because often, sometimes there's white space for a reason, uh, because it's very, very difficult to pull off. So sometimes you think, oh, you know, you can have the best of both worlds. Amazing. It's like, there's probably a reason why it's quite difficult to have something that's really ethically produced and also, you know, really cheap. They kind of don't really go hand in hand. So, you know, if you can find a way to go around that, that's brilliant. And like, you're, you're probably onto a, a winner. But I think just make sure that you're not sort of selling something that you can't actually follow through on because people, you know, consumers are much more critical these days. They want to know you know what you're doing so if you're trying to sell something that's being ethical and it's not actually ethical i think it's just only going to bite you in the bum in the long run and it's not really going to help your strategy so i think just being really clear on that from the get-go and also just making sure that it fits into everything you're doing so if your positioning is as i said to be sort of a more ethical brand is that also going into like your comms are your comms sort of worded in a way that are you know are you considering wider issues are you you know speaking in a way that's kind like are you dealing how you're dealing with your partners are you, are you behaving ethically in that way so it's never become more I think it's never been more important to make sure that whatever your strategy is it's actually being implemented into everything you're doing as a business and if you don't feel that you're able to do that I'd probably suggest not pushing it too strongly from the beginning I mean if you feel like this is where you are now and this is when you can get to in future you can always have that sort of strategy but maybe don't push it quite so strongly if it's not something that you can follow through on for a while um, I think the next thing, yeah, so who are your key audiences? So yeah, I think that's obviously really important to consider who are the audiences. I think a lot of the time you feel it's tempting to sort of be like, oh, everyone can love my product, which I'm sure is the case. But when, you know, when you've got a limited budget and you're starting out, it's a lot better to sort of be engaging with people that already have some buy-in to what you're doing um, because they'll just be easier to convert, which I'm sure Kirsty and Sally will speak a bit more about later in terms of targeting. But um, yeah, so I think just mapping those out, who are the people that already have some buy-in? And then of course you can widen over time as you have larger budgets and you kind of you become more established as a business. And if you're creating your own sort of market as well, then obviously as that market becomes more established. Cool, should we go on to the next? Thank you. Um, cool, so then once you have that strategy in place, uh, bringing it to life. So yeah, I think just being really strategic about where, where are your key audiences? So once you've mapped out those audiences, where do they talk, you know where do they spend most of their time do they spend most of their time on facebook do they spend most of their time you know going to events and try and understand what kind where can you find them where can you access them and what kind of messages are going to really resonate with them and then i think also mapping out objectives is really important um i think it's easy when you start out to kind of feel like you want to do a little bit of everything but sometimes you know that you can kind of just spread yourself too thinly and not really have the impact that you're looking for um, so I think just being really clear about what is it that's actually going to provide value for me in the short term and you can map those out over a certain periods of time so let's say in the first three months your key goal is that you want website visits for example and then maybe in six months it can be more about purchase conversions but at the beginning you just want more people to know who you are and you know to maybe engage with you on social media or whatever but being really clear on those I think are really helpful and then you can kind of figure out what is going to help you get there and then I think choosing a few channels to start off with um, so I think, yeah, sometimes it can be, again, tempting to kind of just feel like you want to do everything, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, which, you know, it, it is great. And it's definitely if you have the resources to do so, then by all means, it's amazing to test, you know, to test everything. But I think if you have limited resources, it's much more effective to just obviously review your audiences, what you want to tell them and, th and think what is actually going to be the best channel for me to share that message. 
start with that and then obviously you know if it doesn't meet your objectives if it's not if it's not sort of helping you then you can move on to something else but don't overstretch yourself because I think then you kind of nothing will work out and then you won't actually have any clarity on what's working for you because you haven't kind of given it the time and effort that it needs to actually succeed and that's another thing is that nothing is gonna you know work out overnight you do need to give it a bit of time um but yeah as long as you feel like you've given it the time and energy and if it's not giving you the returns then you know at least you know that and you can move on to something else um and then yeah of course diversity and representation i think this is obviously something that's really really important always but especially recently been a lot spoken about it and i think um yeah it's only going to become more important i think it's also a key aspect of strategy because if you're not actually speaking to a wide range of people then you're not going to be able to target a wide range of people with your product so you know you need to make sure that the people you're working with are you know are diverse that you're speaking you know you're, you're engaging with a wide range of partners um and also of course if you are working with a product that does benefit from another society so for example for us we make tempeh which is indonesian um, and so for us, it's really, really important that we, um, so we have one of our co-founders is Indonesian. We have team members in Indonesia, um, but giving back to Indonesia is a really key part of our brand. And I think that's something that's only become more important to make sure that we always kind of, yeah, just always are representative in everything that we do. Um, so yeah, I think that's also something that's definitely worth considering just starting out. If that is something you're doing, how can you give back and how can you make that a key aspect of your strategy? And how can you make sure you're sort of representing everyone in your strategy? and you know how you're able to target a wide range of people so i think those are kind of key questions to reflect on brilliant thanks sir. i think yeah that that part about giving back to your what your brand comes from or represents i think it's really important i really like that really like that point so thanks very much um so moving on now we're going to talk to to kirsty i think um now more than ever because it's important to get social media marketing right um and it'd be interesting to hear about from you how you would suggest companies approach this in the rest of this year and even beyond if you can move on to the next slide that'd be great please sure okay so a bit of a tall order having five minutes to talk about so <laughs> i'm so passionate about so you can see my style of slide here is very different and i thought what i do in the next five minutes is just give a whistle stop tour really of the areas of social media that you should be considering so i'm coming at this from a point of view that um you're either using social media or you're just about to use social media or take social media seriously for your brand and your business i honestly believe that a social media manager and as part of your marketing team is the hardest role. You're part artist, you're part scientist, you're expected to be a wordsmith and create amazing content, but you're also expected to be able to read data and drive and use that to drive back into your strategy. So um, social media is so much more than, hey, can you put this on social? Social media is where your customers are. It's almost the open door into your brand or into your business. And there are a myriad of channels and platforms that you can now be present on. So I'm going to be, it's quite a broad brush, but I'm going to do a whistle stop tour of all these top, these areas of social that you could um, be, and that you could improve as a business. Number one, and this is actually one of my top tips, listening on social. You should listen as much as you talk. So listening to your audience across your channels is so important. So that might be direct mentions that are coming into you. As Alan mentioned, it could be listening to hashtags. It could just be listening to topics on social media as well and using the platforms to engage with potential customers or current customers who are talking about your brand, your business or your industry. Number two to consider is influencer marketing. I like to say this could be standing on the shoulders of giants. Just because you have platforms, it doesn't mean you are the only voice. Working with other people who have got the influence um, is an amazing thing to, thing to be doing. It doesn't always come at a price as well. You can use um, a gifting strategy here to reach more people. Crisis PR. If, it's going, if something bad is going to happen and people are going to talk about your brand or your business, it will happen on Twitter first. So make sure, tie back to that first point, that you are listening. If you open up a social channel, be um, present on it, be listening and be expected to know exactly what to do. If something happens, you need to have your responses sorted. Next thing is customer service. So again, very linked to the first couple of points or the first three points I've talked about. From a customer service point of view, be where your customers are. Do not direct them to another channel. If they're direct messaging you through Messenger or on Facebook, have your responses set to be able to respond to them in that channel they're in. Ellen's covered strategy, but a strategy on social media is not a broad brush. 
For me, you need to be thinking about your strategy per platform because there will be different types of customers on different platforms. So strategy for me is segmentation, targeting and proposition. Segment your customer, which channel are they on? You can't talk to everybody everywhere. Um, target them with the correct content and with the correct media. And then most importantly, what is your proposition on that channel? What are you using that channel for? Now, row two, content creation, I guess is what people think about um, when they think about social. You've got to post all the time and um, it becomes a challenge. You have this always on approach where you need to be creating that content and you also need to be creating content that is right in the right format for the right channels. Don't create a lovely YouTube video and then just expect to be able to put that on Instagram. It won't work. So think about your content strategy. A campaign, a campaign for me has a start date, an end date, and its own set of goals. Social is a fantastic way to run that campaign. And on the next slide, we we'll keep going really fast. I will talk to you about how to output a campaign. Oh, sorry, no, not next slide yet. Thank you. <laughs> Lead generation. So where, what do you want people to do from your social channels? Where do you want to drive them? Is it to your website? Is it to your, a different channel? Are you trying to garner leads? Are you trying to garner sales? A lot of the platforms now allow you to generate leads directly from the website. And a top tip, Facebook have just started Facebook email marketing. So you can take all of that data and then actually email your leads directly from the platform. Advertising, which Sally will talk about in more detail. Fantastic through social. Uh, they know so much about you, which makes the targeting options perfect. And then finally, the last thing you need to do is get your head into that data and that insight. So going back to what Ellen was saying about really understanding your audience, the platforms also have fantastic analytics sections, which really allow you to understand who is on those channels and what kind of content they're looking for. So whistle stop. If anyone says, what's the social media team doing? Show them this slide. <laughs> this pretty much summarizes what you need to be doing in social media in 2020. <laughs> Now, very quickly, I will just, um, I'm already on five minutes, so I will just nip onto the next slide. Um, this is to demonstrate that through social, it is no longer just somewhere that you push your content out through. Think of it in three different ways. Your owned content, so what you can own, optimizing your channels, setting up your own Facebook groups, running your events through social. Then think about earned media that comes back to that social listening part what can you be doing to engaging with those people that are talking about your brand how can you earn media through social how can they be sharing your brand story on your behalf and then finally which i won't go into detail in in at all is paid so you need to consider how you can reach more people especially if you're a new brand don't just expect to set up your own channels and all of your customers to flood to them. You need to pay to reach them, to drive them back to your own channels. So if I could leave you with anything, approaching from a paid, owned and earned point of view would be my key takeaway for social media in 2020. And that, guys, is my whistle stop. <laughs> well, I know I spoke really fast, but I'm hoping that I stuck to my time. Oh, Kirsty, you did very, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. And I think there'll be a few social media managers with that previous slides sell tape to their, their desk and be able to go, this is what I do. <laughs> this is why I'm so busy. <laughs> T-shirts made at some point as well. Just to go, yeah, this is my job. Um, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, and I'll, I'll talk to everybody later about how you can rewatch this session. Um, so people will be able to go back and, and see these slides and take, and take more away from it. But I, I, think I went so far, well. but any questions, obviously you can yeah, share my email with us afterwards. Great. Thank you so much. That was great. Wonderful. So um, we're going to move on to Sally now. And Sally, um, getting social advertising right, I think, is, is one of the sort of dark arts. I think it's really tricky. Um, how do you think businesses ensure that they play that game? They do it well, basically. Yeah, and I, I think this is where kind of um, Kirsty kind of touched upon, you know, for social media managers or, you know, marketers or business owners in general, you kind of, to win at social, need the two heads. You need to kind of have that um, creative kind of artistic element to it, but you also need the science kind of part of it. And probably this science part of it is where advertising comes in. The way that the platforms work and the way that the platforms have changed over time means that they have quite strict algorithms and Facebook is particularly um, a stickler for this one. So, and also Facebook owns Instagram now as well, as well as WhatsApp Messenger as well. So um, 
it can be quite a bit of a minefield. And I think because of the way that the algorithms are structured, you're only ever going to get around one to two percent organic reach. So this kind of plan that we always used to work to that we grow this great community size and all this community would see all of our content it just doesn't work and i think as kirsty alluded to you can craft the best content in the world but just because you put it out there doesn't mean people are going to see it um and doesn't mean it's going to stick and actually what the algorithms have done is kind of force people to pay to play now and that's kind of that kind of term that we use that actually um you need to think about, okay, once you've crafted this piece, great piece of content, who's going to see it, where they're most active, and how you're going to reach them. Um, we generally say, and I think particularly because video is so big on social now, that if you're going to pay to create a video, at least put the same amount that you paid for that video behind promoting it. Because obviously, if you paid five grand for a video, and you put 50 quid behind that video, well, <laughs> you're not going to see that return. And I'm sure that's something that Malcolm might come on to at a later point in terms of senior return on investment. Um, I think some of the tips that I'll go through today, but um, I think particularly from a small business perspective, and particularly speaking about Facebook directly here, um, I would always urge you to move away from the boost button. So I think what Facebook has been very, very good at is directing small businesses to this nice button that says, why don't you boost your content? And sometimes it will be for such a random amount, like for nine pounds, you could reach 12 times your audience size. And you're like, oh yeah, I'll, I'll go at that for nine pounds. You put nine pounds on there and you're like, that didn't do anything. Number one, what does nine pounds do in anything? It's probably get by you your lunch these days. Um, but also it's just kind of like it, it hasn't been factored into what that strategy is, etc. And I think what Ellen and Kirsty have both gone into is kind of like, what do you want that piece of advertising to do? Who do you want it to talk to? And what do you want them to do off the back of it? And that's really what you need to think about apart from just a cost thing where you're just kind of like, oh, for nine pounds, I could do this. It's kind of actually, no, taking a step back and thinking about it. And for that reason, we would always recommend that you kind of build your advertising through the platforms directly. So get a kind of Facebook business manager account. Pinterest has a business account now. Even TikTok has a business center account as well. So if you are kind of operating and talking to those younger audiences, definitely look at setting up business accounts where you can be way more structured and targeted and have much more control over your budgets and what your activity is doing than just hitting this boost button, which is a bit kind of like pie in the sky, money going out there, you don't know what it's kind of doing. Um, so I kind of have four key tips for you today, really, um, to make sure that actually your social media advertising is giving you a positive return and a positive effect on your business, regardless of that kind of objective. And that's kind of where we start, really, it is with your objective. So um, I think Kirsty kind of mentioned this, whether you're going in for kind of leads or sales, what is it that you want this piece of activity to do? And be quite honest there as well. I think sometimes as marketeers or even business owners, we can be like, yeah, I just want to make people aware of my business. But then you'll end up criticizing the advertising because it didn't drive any sales. Well, if you set something up to make people aware of your business, it's probably not going to drive sales, particularly the way that Facebook works. If you set up based on an objective, so they're running three, which is awareness, consideration and conversion. If you set something up around the consideration area, which is generally traffic or video views, but what Facebook will do is look for people that are likely to click on ads or look for people that are likely to view ads. So if you want them actually to make a sale, don't buy it on a traffic because they're looking for clicky people and they are exactly that. They will click on those ads and probably bounce back out again. So from a, from a quality perspective, they're not right. If you're looking for people to actually buy, you should be operating in that conversion kind of area, not at that traffic kind of point. Because you think in your head, you're like, well, if we get more traffic to our website, we'll get more sales. That's not always the case. And you can end up sending what I call dirty traffic to your website, which overall affects your kind of conversion rate, but also just means that your website is just having to work quite hard to get very little in return. I mean, this is the second point is something we've talk, talked about quite a bit this morning, but I can't kind of um, yet stress enough for what Ellen and Kirsty both said around your audiences. Who is it you want to talk to? And I think Ellen made this point really well. Sometimes you can be like, everyone. 
And yes, we all want to talk to everyone. Um, and in a sense, because we're quite used to above the line advertising that does talk to everyone and everyone on the side of the M6. But what digital advertising, particularly social, allows you to do is what Kirsty touched upon is about segmenting your audience. So really segment that audience so you know who you want to talk to about particular products with particular messaging because they will resonate significantly better. And as Ellen said, you will probably see a much higher conversion come off the back of that rather than just doing a bit of a blanket approach to everybody. And that kind of leads me into my third point about nailing your creative. So this is where you put your artist's head back on again. It, who is that target audience and what makes them tick? So what is the message that's going to make them tick? Is it actually um, putting out a key benefit of the product or actually is it talking much more broad and much more lifestyle around that? kind of topic. Um, whichever it is, do your audience research beforehand so you know what makes them tick and build that into your creative. Don't just kind of think that everybody's going to think the same and give them one creative. Also, I would also recommend split testing creatives or giving the platform multiple creatives to test from because it will reward you for that because it has more to go off and more to show people and it will generally just start optimising towards the top performing. And my fourth kind of piece is to make sure you have tracking in place. As we all know, the benefit of digital media is you can track everything. It can also be its downfall because then people are like granular on the data. But if you've got your tracking in place, you'll be able to see that. So make sure you use pixel technology, which Facebook, Pinterest, TikTok, Twitter, LinkedIn, all have pixels. So make sure you put those on your website, either get your developer to put those in the header tags or a really good way of doing it is through Google Tag Manager. And then you can house all of your um, pixels within there. And then actually you can track lots of different events that happen on your website. So you can be really kind of micro in terms of the events that you want to target here. And then obviously you can see what return comes off the back of it, which I'm sure Malcolm will talk to you in a lot more detail. But I think those are my kind of four key tips to trying to get it right and moving away from just boosting content. Great, thank you, Sally. I think the um, the pixel thing is something which has come up in a number of webinars over the past few weeks. I think that's something which is obviously very important to to get right and to get as, as on your website or on your social as soon as possible, right? Yeah, definitely. And even if you're not running advertising now, at least get it on there. Yeah. And then when you are kind of looking to um, start some advertising, you. I say you've gone through that pain. It's, it's not that painful. It just, it seems a bit scary because it's a piece of code and everyone's a bit like, oh, but you can easily make it, but you does need to be attached to an ad account. So it is basically from an advertising perspective. But what it will allow you to do as well is have a bit of a differentiation between that and Google Analytics. Google Analytics will never favor social because it's not a Google product. Sure. So um, always kind of bear that in mind that the, the data will be different. Okay, great. That was really useful. Thanks so much, Sally. That was excellent. Um, so we're going to move on to Malcolm now. Um, Malcolm, there are a lot of people watching today that probably won't have huge budgets for marketing. Uh, so as an accountant, um, it'd be great to get your views on what you see as the best ways to succeed in this, this area with the sort of limited spending power. Yeah, um, it's quite daunting, isn't it? If you're a business, uh, setting up a business, you know, I noticed there's a lot of people there that are self-employed, got, you know, um, less than five employees. So, you know, you will be involved in all aspects of this business and, um, and, and you've got to be a marketing expert as well. And, you know, and I sort of almost liken it to um, being in a restaurant and being given this great big wine menu and, you know, you've got to choose... Um, one bottle out of pages and pages um, and you know half of the stuff is in a foreign language that you don't understand so you either just randomly pick um, one particular bottle um, or or you ask for the house red um, or you pick nothing you know um, and in, uh, in in our industry you know accountants have not been the best at marketing there's a few good examples out there these days um, but, you know, the, the equivalent of the house red is sort of some of these template websites that um, are, are full of stock photos of wildly attractive people who clearly don't work at that um, accountancy practice. Um, or, you know, or, or alternatively, people just, people just do nothing. And, um, but it's important that, you, that you're going to do something and that you find something that works for your business. And I think the first... Um, the first tip I'd say actually is pay somebody else for their time, you know, rather than just looking for some marketing stuff that you can buy. So you find yourself dealing with somebody that's, you know, trying to sell you something, 
you know, um, the, 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 our previous presenters, um, you know, they, they will provide a service to give you some advice, you know, do some reading, just try and build up a little bit of knowledge because you've got to pick something that works. Um, and, and you don't have to be the best at marketing in your industry. One of, the, um, one of the things that sort of inspired me about 20 years ago was when I signed up a client from a much bigger firm uh, than we were at the time. And, um, and when the client told the accountant that he was leaving, um, this accountant said, um, they're no better than we are, you know, they've just got better marketing. And, um, and, and initially I was sort of irritated by that because I thought, no, we are better than them. But actually I thought, well, you know, just I'll let that, that point wash over me. The point was, it's important to be better than most of your competitors. If you're better than most of your competitors, your business will grow. Um, if you're, you know, to be the best marketing in your industry, it's probably going to cost you way too much money and you'll spend so much time on it that you'll be ignoring other aspects of your business. You'll be getting loads of new customers in and they'll all be leaving because the service is poor. So you just need to get some of the basics um, right and then find some techniques that work. One of the first basics is make sure you've got a good database. There's loads of these around. I'm not going to recommend any um, because most of the best one for you is probably an industry-based package. Um, if you go onto the app page on the Xero website, I know quite a few of the businesses watching will be using Xero, um, and just um, just type in sales database on the search function, you'll just find loads. So research something that works for you that is good value for money. You don't have to spend thousands on it, just a small subscription every month. And then think about how you're getting your potential customers information into that database so um, you know just on a simple level making sure that whoever answers the telephone in your business has a simple list of questions that they ask to anybody that is, is making an inquiry um, might only be five or six questions but that is giving you some key data that you can then put into the uh, the database so that you've got something that you can, um, you've got the details that you can um, promote special offers in the future about. Um, but also, you know, an inquiry box on your website so that people are putting the basic information in and that's filtering through to the database. And, um, it, and, and, and that's critical um, because um, you'll never realize what, how poor your sign up percentage is until you actually record all the inquiries and, and um, and, and realise how few of them became customers. So um, getting all that information there enables you to you know, warm up all those leads um, that, that went cold quite quickly. And the next thing is just to get the balance right between three types of marketing. So you know, um, like, like everyone has spoken today, we could all talk for about an hour on our subject. Um, for, if we can click through to my next slide, um, there, there's so much, there's so much terminology in marketing. I just, I just break it down into three types of marketing. Inbound is stuff where people come to you. So historically, that you know would be advertising. People see your name, ring up you, or turn up at your premises or whatever. Um, and um, the, the main one now, of course, is search engine optimization. Um, outbound is when you are approaching them. So you know traditionally that might be mail shots, that might be telesales. Um, you know, the, um, the guy that did the drives of um, well, a couple, one of the neighbours went round and knocked on the doors of everybody else in the road and just said, you know, we're doing a, um, we're doing a drive for one of your neighbours, don't know if you might be interested. Um, and, you know, that's outbound. It's actually um, contacting your potential customers. And people can be a bit frightened of doing that. They're a little bit uncomfortable doing it, so they, so they don't. And then the last one, um, which you know, particularly works for professional services um, and work for us is referral. So this is getting, um, doing stuff that encourages other people to refer new business to you. And if I can just give you one very simple tip on referral marketing, because uh, I could bang on about it for, for ages. Um, if you're providing a service, when you finish providing that service, when it's done, the bill is paid, it's definitely come to an end. Ring up your customer and ask them, are you happy with what we've done for you? Hopefully they will say yes. If they don't, if they say no, then you can find out what they're unhappy about and do something about it. Because um, what you want to avoid is negative referrals where they're saying, oh, I had this company in and they were 
looking an awful. Um, but if they say yes, which hopefully they will, the next thing you say is, well, look, we're trying to build up our business. If there's any of your, um, the people that you know that would benefit from that and are looking for um, my service, I mean, adapt what I've just said into your own version, um, would you mind letting them know? And most people will, you know, but, but most people won't tell others about a good product or a good service um, because they've got so much going on in their lives. But if you ask them to, they will. And um, so that, that's from your customers. The second is just find other people that provide services or products to customers who um, are the same sort of customers as you. So, you know, the, the simplest example of that is just the plumber and the electrician. You know, the, um, you know it will, if, if you're a plumber, you need to have an electrician, okay, because half the time there'll be, um, there'll be electrical work that needs to do. So find someone you can recommend who's going to enhance your reputation by coming in. And, and the work that you refer to them, hopefully they will refer work in return. So whatever it is you do, there will be somebody um, of that nature. And, and, try, and, and just try and bind all this stuff together into a, an overall marketing strategy that gets you a good return on investment. Brilliant. Thank you, Malcolm. Really insightful, really interesting points there made and some uh, yeah some really great stuff for our attendees so thank you very much for that so we're going to move on now to uh last few slides actually before we get on to the q a section um so if we can move on to this section here the hints and tips um we'd be just going to run through the panelists there are some links which i'll put into the chat room as well as we as we go along so we'll just start with uh sally i think is the first one is that right sally? yeah so um i obviously talked quite heavily in my section about being objective kind of based so social advertising does run based on your objective so really think about what that objective is obviously what i did mention is sometimes we can measure activity on the wrong objective so we are actually looking for sales but we're running it on awareness objective so if you do want to look for sales then run things on a conversion based activity but one thing to kind of touch upon and I think Ellen mentioned this you need to give it time and actually what ads will do is get stuck in what's called learning so you need 25 to 35 conversions before your ad will come out of a learning phase so if you see it stuck in that kind of phase don't panic give it time if you obviously have kind of given it some time and it's still stuck in that phase you might want to look at a conversion higher up the funnel so if you are looking for an absolute final purchase and you're say an e-commerce website you might want to look at running those changing those ads to run on an add to cart conversion rather than a final purchase where you will see more conversions come through quickly it will come out of that learning phase which is, tends to be more expensive and it has a limited kind of effect on your ads so get to a point where you can get to 35 conversions as quickly as possible your ads will come out of learning it will reduce in cost and then it will start really start ramping up in terms of volume you can sometimes look around three to five days for this to happen so i would also say to be patient off the back of that too and don't panic too quickly but after about five days you might want to make a change if you're not seeing that come out of learning but I think Cohen's just put a link to Facebook Blueprint in the chat, which I'd really recommend. So if you are going to look at dabbling in Facebook advertising, some of the Blueprint courses that Facebook offer for free are really quite useful. And some of them are only five to 10 minutes long. You can literally search the subjects that you're looking to kind of um, get some knowledge on. Um, and when I say take a course, it's more kind of like um, interactive kind of informative information. And they're about five, like five to 15 minutes long. So it, it's not that painful, actually. Great, thanks Sally. Uh, I think Kirsty, the next viewer from, from you on me. Yes, so I think I've already mentioned this, but when you're using social media on behalf of your brand and your business, it isn't really about just putting out your brand messages. It's more of a two-way conversation. So think about the reasons that you personally use social media. So that might be to catch up with friends and family, to um, see what news is breaking, for instance. It might just be because you are stalking your old friends from school. Um, think about people, yourself using it when you're using it from a brand's point of view. People don't go onto social media to look for a new service or a new product. They're there to pass time. So, Yes, it's okay to be publishing and to be talking about your brand of business, but also think about um, following your audience back. Look at what they're posting and actually comment on some of their posts as well. 
Um, so it's that mixture, it's getting the mixture right really, so you're not just publishing brand messages without joining in on conversations that are happening around relevant topics. So I just wanted to make that point really clear. And the next point is on the platform functionality. Facebook has come on so far and it's almost trying, while it is rivaling Google, it wants your Facebook business profile to be like a website and it offers so much functionality. You can, you can have a shop through Facebook now. You can list out your services and have landing pages for all of the different services you offer. You can book appointments through Facebook. And I mentioned earlier, you can send email marketing now through Facebook. So it's almost utilize, make sure you're utilizing everything you can. You can set up events. You can, you've got the direct chat function in there. So use it. It's there for a purpose. Facebook specifically, well, all of the channels like it when you pick up and utilize that new functionality that's coming out. So use what they give you. So be on top of those new functions that are, are being um, launched. And then finally, you can't be everywhere. There are so many social channels that you could um, utilize. So my top tip here would be thinking back to your strategy, thinking back to who your customers are and where they are, which channels are they using, and pick the right ones that you feel confident in using yourself. So you know, for instance, that your customers are using, utilizing YouTube, but you don't have the, you might not have the um, capacity in house or the budget to create YouTube videos. So don't do it. Look at where your customers are and where you also feel comfortable using those platforms. And they'd be my three top tips from today. Great. Thanks, Kirsty. Uh, Malcolm, I think yours is the, is the next one there. Yeah, um, I mean, mine may appear to be a shameless plug to steer everybody <laughs> towards our website, but uh, appearances can be deceptive. Um, and, and the reason I put that down was because, um, at the, you know, at the moment, there's, just, there's so much has changed over the last five months. And we, you know, we, we started um, banging stuff out to our clients um, on the 13th of March, which was about 10 days um, before lockdown, with all the stuff that they needed to be thinking about to cope with um, you know, what's happened in the last few months and what is still gonna happen over the next couple of years. So um, if, you just, if you just Google A4G Coronavirus Hub, I mean, I think about the first three pages will come up as, as us, and there's, there's, there's loads of free um, resources on there and content about all sorts of um, things, so. Perfect. Thanks. I've just put the uh, the link in the chat room there as well, so you can click on that and go go straight to it. Um, wonderful. So, Ellen, the last couple of, uh, from you, I'm a little bit conscious of time for the Q and A session, but tell um, me, yeah, please do. Uh, right. I'll be quick. Question. Okay. <laughs> Cool, yeah, the first one for me is look at Mintel report. So, I mean, those are the reports I was kind of talking about earlier, which are quite expensive, but there are a few ways to go around it. If you're based in London, the British Library actually offers all Mintel reports that have ever been printed for free. Um, but I think you have to physically go there, but also you can have access to universities as well. So if you have any good uh, connections, make the most of them. Um, so yeah, there are some other ways you can access those reports. And then obviously if you're working in, um, working with an agency or something then or a freelancer sometimes they will have access to, to those reports so i would recommend taking a look they do cover um a lot of interesting stuff and also they have um like they have longer papers but also summaries which are just a bit easier uh, to digest so i would recommend them if you can access them um, another thing is to set up google alerts around the market you're interested in um, so yeah it's really really easy you just literally google google alerts and then you just set it up and you can choose which keywords you want so uh, for us, for example, I, obviously, I have like, our name, so just to know if we come up in anything, as well as like tempeh and some stuff around plant-based protein as well. Um, and it's just good because it just keeps you up to date. You can choose a frequency of how often they come through over emails. So it can be a daily update, it can be every week, um, whatever, whatever you like. But I think it's just important to make sure you're kind of keeping up to date with what's going on in your industry, um, just so you can adapt your strategy accordingly. Um, and then the last one is, yeah, follow a range of influences in your market. Um, so yeah, kind of similar to what I was talking about earlier, there are definitely ways in which you can access industry information without having to spend loads of money. Um, and similar to what Kirsty was saying, you know, it's so important to be listening to what people are saying. Um, and so just using social as like an actual research tool is actually also really, really effective. Um, and yeah, and like listening to comments as well. So don't just listen to the influencers. What are people responding to them? They're saying they like this product. Are people questioning, you know, is something they're not sure about or something they really wish was in the product? Um, and that's all really useful stuff that you can then implement into your strategy. Um, so yeah, to kind of 
simple ways in which you can just access the information to create a really robust strategy. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you for being speedy on those as well. Um, so we're going to uh, have a Q&A session in a moment. Um, I'm just going to give you a few minutes to get your questions in. So we just go on to the next slide, please. I just want to um, give you a quick bit more information about Tide and how easy it is for you guys, any new non-members to sign up. So if you are not a member, um, you can visit our website. Uh, if you're a member, you can visit our website too. If that's too much uh, effort for you, next week you'll receive an email from us, all of you will. Uh, and on that email, there'll be a link to rewatch this webinar. So if you missed a few slides or some points, you can rewatch that webinar using that link. Uh, also, if you aren't one of our 200,000 members, there'll be a link on that web, uh, link on that email, sorry, for you to sign up. All you need to do is click on that link, um, download the wonderful Tide app, which I discussed earlier, Follow those very easy, very simple instructions, and then you'll be able to start using Tide for your business banking needs. Um, for links to all of our amazing previous webinars uh, or information on upcoming events, please visit our blog site and events page in the uh, chat room, which I've just put into there now, uh, or the chat room, or the chat room, whichever, wherever you are. Um, we, of course, also have a wonderful YouTube channel, um, so please use the link again in the chat room to have a look at that, uh, subscribe, and all the links to our social channels are in the chat room too. So like, follow, and stay up to date with all time information through those links. If you are watching this on our YouTube channel, please hit the subscribe button below. Um, it's an easy way to keep up to date with all our new webinars that are coming, and it gives you a chance to look around uh, the full playlist as well. And please leave us some comments. If you have any ideas or thoughts of future webinars, which you'd like to hear from us future speakers, please do let us know. We really want to, to sort of put some webinars on um, with some feedback after some feedback from our from our attendees. Um, again, if you're watching this live, don't need to feel left out either. Please leave us uh, a message in the chat room. Uh, if you have any specific subjects or topics or speakers you would like to hear from, um, let us know. Uh, give us give us some names and ideas or topics and we'll do our best to get those to you in the next few weeks and months. Um, perfect, so that's it. Keep an eye out for that email if you would like to sign up. Also, if you, sorry, one more thing, if you would like, if you put your phone number in, uh, the registration process, there'll be a phone call coming to you uh, in the next few days uh, from our Tide members to help you out with any questions you have. Right, so let's get on to the Q&A section. We've had a good number of questions coming through. Let's start with um, this one from Walter S. Walter is one of our uh, members who joins us on a very regular occasion. So good to see you again, Walter. Um, he has said, thinking of the starting poll where we you know, find out, found out how many people we had on board uh, with the companies of one to five people they're unlikely to have a dedicated social media manager so what would the actionable advice be for a solopreneur he calls himself uh kirsty maybe that's good for him yeah through? sure i should probably caveat by we only had five minutes <laughs> so <laughs> i wouldn't be able to go through everything that you'd need to do from social like i said from the start there are you know, tens, hundreds of platforms to, to talk about from a social point of view. But from a solo, solopreneur point of view, um, I would probably revert back to those three key tips that I had at the end. So you can't be everywhere. So pick the channels you feel confident in. Um, listen more than, than you talk. And going back to what I said about strategy, so, and what Ellen touched on, understand who you're talking to and then create the content for them in, in the right channel. But um, yeah, in terms of, uh, yeah, if Walter wanted to know more, he, <laughs> I feel like I could spend a day workshopping that with. <laughs> so I'm, apologies that it wasn't full of practical top tips, but it would have been a hundred page of top tips and Kieran wouldn't, well, only gave me two slides. <laughs> <laughs> Don't blame me. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, the, um, what was I gonna say? So yeah, just think, just, to link back to what was Kirsty said, we are obviously getting towards 12 o'clock right now. I think uh, we will continue uh, as long as there's some, I think a few panelists can stay after 12 and we'll continue answering questions in, until we run out of them. And But if, as I mentioned before, we will be um, uh, recording this, it's been recorded, it will go onto our YouTube channel and, we'll, and onto our blog post as well. So if there are questions that you want just to find out the answers to and you need to leave at 12, we'll be answering as many as we can. Uh, so next one is, let's have a look at this one from Kevin Vardy. He's asked for some more details on Google's Pixel solution. Um, maybe Sally, that's, that's for you. Uh, yeah, I'll take that one. So um, the Google Pixel solution is called Google Tag Manager. So you do still have to implement a piece of code on your website to implement Google Tag Manager. 
but it means so say for example if you were active on facebook pinterest linkedin twitter you wouldn't have to install all of those pieces of code if you just get your um advertise your kind of web developer to put the google tag manager code on your website and then give you publisher access to it it almost acts as like a little house for all of the pieces of code and you can easily just go in and add your um facebook code add your linkedin code add your pinterest code so you can get a developer to do one piece of code and then you can do the rest quite easily and then once you have that tag manager set up you can make those custom conversions that i talked about so if for example you've got um something really simple like a data capture form on site you can then fire that um piece of code when somebody enters their details on that so you know how many people you can track how many people have entered their details so yeah that's google tag manager is the kind of easiest way if you've got multiple pieces of code that you want to kind of house from a social perspective rather than having to add each piece of code individually um just on that as well you can also get some chrome extensions which are really useful so um facebook and pinterest have um pixel helpers as they're called so you can then see when you load your website or any website you can see if there is code firing on that website so just if you're ever unsure whether you've done it correctly install those pixel helpers and it will show you that you've actually your code is firing and that's all working well it just gives you that peace of mind perfect thanks Ellie. and um, there's a question coming from uh, Nadja she's asking if we can email you guys after the webinar there my email address is on the uh, the zoom information that you would have got for the email so please just send any questions or further questions you have to that email and i'll forward them on and we'll get you guys linked up post event um what have we got what else have we got uh da, 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 da. one of the one from walter uh, how do you rate publishing content on linkedin is it worth the time um who would be the best for that one anyone kirsty perfect thank you um if your audience is on linkedin then be on LinkedIn. Um, it is the number one business to business social media platform. I absolutely love it. I would say yes, but I don't know um, what Walter's business is. So it comes back to where your audience are and if you've got the capacity and you believe it's the right time for your strategy. But um, I'm a huge fan of LinkedIn. You get great reach. Um, it knows so much about where people work. So the targeting is also fantastic. So yes, I would say would be my answer to that. <laughs> Good. Uh, and then somebody else asked, is Tide supporting startups with capital for market, marketing and advertising? I guess I have to take that one. Um, so we are uh, trialing something with our members at the moment, which is a sponsorship for networking events. So if you are a Tide member, another amazing reason to become a Tide member, um, you can apply for sponsorship for your networking events. Um, there's obviously a limit on the amount we'll, we'll give you through your application, but that money can then be used for your marketing, for your advertising, uh, all that kind of stuff as well. So it's something we're trialing with our members at the moment. So do, um, if you are a member, please do send an email to me again on the email, which has just gone into the chat and we can try and lay that up for you. And if it's something which is of interest to you and you're a non-member, then it's another reason to become a member with Tide. Um, uh, let's see what else have we got uh, Roger he is saying using database etc how do you comply with cold calling legislation I guess was that something that you talked about Malcolm is that something you some, uh, you're on mute Malcolm sorry are you there oh you're on mute still <laughs> there you go perfect some reason I couldn't find the mute button. Um, I'm mute <laughs> um, yeah, well, one of my marketing team looks after all that. So, um, <laughs> but you know, obviously, you've got the telephone preference service stuff. You've got um, GDPR. There's, there are quite a few bits of legislation that um, you need to be careful of. But just just do your homework. It, the, the information's all there. Most yeah. stuff's on government websites. Um, if you wanna, if you wanna find it. Um, a lot of the database programs are tuned in to um, having to um, comply with the legislation. So, uh, but I wouldn't want to try and give a 10 second answer to that question. Okay, great stuff, thank you. Um, and I think we've got well, just one more question. We're at 12 now, but this will be the last one. It's, it's worked out quite nicely. Um, where has it gone? Uh, yes, again, from Walter, perfect. Do you have practical ways to get measurable ROI on an ad? Uh, Sally? Yeah, so again, without a bit of a cop out, I suppose it does depend on what your objective is. But I do think, though, if you've got pixel tracking in place, then you can set that objective and you can fire um, the pixel on those events. So when you set your ad up, if the objective is conversions, for example, but the conversion is people signing up 
on your on your website, you would then be able to um, filter your report to see how many people actually made that action on your website. You can even put a value in on that as well. So you, when you're setting up that kind of conversion, you can put a value in on it. So it will register how many of those come through. And obviously you've got that value on it and then divide that by the amount you spent to get your kind of, I would call that more of a return on ad spend rather than a full return on investment because that's not taking into account any creative costs or your salaries or et cetera. So look at measuring that on a ROAS perspective, so return on ad spend rather than full ROI. But yeah, look at obviously having that um, kind of pixel technology in place and making sure that you track, you understand what that conversion is that someone you're looking for someone to do and then track those and put a value against it as a way to kind of see a return on those ads. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, and that brings us perfectly timed almost to the end of the webinar. I've just sent the poll out for just a quick um, bit of information for us and how you felt the session went. So thank you for answering that. Um, so there, all, all it leads me to do is thank the panel so much. So thank you, Kirsty, Sally, Malcolm, and Ellen. It's been a really interesting session. I really appreciate your time and your effort for the, for the webinar. Uh, to all the attendees, thank you again for sticking around. It's been great to see you all. Keep an eye out for the email coming from us, uh, giving you information on how to join and to get, and do click on those links to um, get on our social channels and our YouTube channel as well. And we look forward to seeing you uh, next week at next week's webinar. Thank you very much.